Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nancy DeCatch. Welcome to the Nancy DeCatch Caregiver Show. Uh, we're getting start this late start this afternoon because we've had some uh, automobile issues, so we apologize for that. But uh, I am in the studio alone today, and uh, John, my uh, technician, is behind the scenes, and you're going to hear his voice, but you won't see his face. But we're going to try and make this a a very good informative show uh, for the caregivers. I want to uh, say thank you to a couple of people who I've made contact with this week and uh, they are some new fans of ours and I want to thank um, Andy Susky Jr. Uh, for his support and also a young lady from Comcast named Keisha and she has been helping me with some very important things uh, in the uh, social media aspect with internet and things like that. So I want to thank you for your support and uh, I hope that you enjoy the show. I just want to mention a little bit about some upcoming things that are happening. Uh, of course, we know Valentine's Day is coming, and so if you have a, a sweetie in your life, make sure that you uh, show that person your appreciation. And if there's a caregiver that you know about, uh, make sure that you get them a little chocolate heart and let them know that you know you appreciate them. And uh, you know, give your florist a call and uh, have them send something out. Um, I just want to mention also that if you're a vendor or, you, or if you're a business out there and you would like to attend our symposium on May 18th at the Birch Run Expo Center in Birch Run, we need you. We need some vendors and some sponsors. We have uh, quite a few already that have signed up, but we have room for more. If you're a business and you have, are paid to care for someone, or if you have an invention or something that uh, would benefit the caregiver, uh, please contact me at 810-845-6713 and let me know that you're interested in participating. We are going to be uh, getting ready for this very, very big event. It's a caregiver retreat and symposium. The symposium is the, uh, the educational side and the retreat is the fun part and the fun part follows the education. We have a fantastic lineup of dynamic speakers. We have the Rick Barnett Financial Group. He is uh, an individual that we send our caregivers to for financial guidance. He will set you up and uh, counsel you uh, with your money so that you don't lose everything that you have worked for like I did in, in my caregiving experience. And when we go after uh, these people, we actually interview them. We're very uh, interested in knowing that when we send our caregivers to uh, the people that collaborate with us, we want to make sure that they're going to get superior uh, guidance and uh, the time that they need and proper counseling. So we are very, very happy uh, to endorse the Rick Barnett Financial Group in Grand Blanc, Michigan. Rick has a TV show, or I'm sorry, a radio show every Thursday morning on uh, the Cumulus Station, and I just can't think of the call letters. I think it's 14.30 a.m., um, and you can listen to his financial show. It's a live show. You can call in and ask any financial question uh, that you have. And you can contact his office as well. We have Dr. Patricia Schmidt, who won Doctor of the Year Award in 2007 from the Michigan Palliative and Hospice um, Association. She's a, just a dynamic individual who cares about you, the caregiver. And she uh, presents this wonderful um, lecture on flowers and bubbles and it's something that every caregiver needs to experience and she's going to be one of our dynamic speakers. We have Tim Skubik from the Lansing area. He has a program on PBS and it's called Off the Record and he puts the Michigan politicians in the hot seat. He is going to be at the symposium on the main stage where we will have two state senators and four state representatives there. And the caregivers are in the audience and we're going to ask the tough questions about the laws and some of the changes that benefit or hurt the family caregiver. And of course, then you're going to hear my story a little bit about why I do what I do and why we have grown as a company so quickly and so fast. And you'll hear a little bit about what I have to say and why I'm doing what I do. And some of you already know that I have nothing to give but 
uh, of myself now. My husband is gone, my family's grown, my grandchildren are starting to grow up, and I have a lot of information and I don't want to take it with me when I leave this earth, but I want to pass it on to you. And so I host these retreats and symposiums and neat things and try to bring a collaboration for us caregivers uh, together. And, and it's very important to me that we have a successful event. We can't have a successful event without you, the caregiver, the family caregiver. You matter so much to us, and I appreciate you, and I want you to know that. So I invite you to come to the symposium and the retreat on May 18th at the Bertrand Expo Center. It costs $5 to get in, so it's really affordable. The party, the retreat side, is going to be an absolute riot. We have bands from all over the place wanting to come and perform for us, and we have a classic car show that wants to come in, and we've just got all types of support, support that I never thought uh, existed out there. But they're doing this for you, the caregiver, to let you know how much you're appreciated. So. I hope you'll contact me, 810-845-6713. If you'd like to shoot me an email, you can uh, address it to nancydcatch at gmail.com or visit our website, www.ndcaregiver.org. Make sure you check out the caregiverconvention.org website to register as a vendor or a sponsor. So we That's have some, some exciting developments going on about the... Um about that big uh, the, the symposium too, didn't you? You got you do now. Once you told me earlier that you want to go into that. I'm gonna turn this mic up just a little bit. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, so okay. you want to talk about that big development um, about the? I don't know if you want to tip your hand right now. Yeah. Or? Well, it's okay about the van. The van. Yeah. You know, we have some wonderful people out there, as I was mentioning before, in um, in my beginning when I was first getting started, um, a lot of different people. Um, came out to the Respa Ranch to see what we were all about. And this one gentleman uh, named Jerry Ogden, he uh, came out to the Respa Ranch when the Mott Community College uh, asked if they could come to our home to see what we're all about. And Jerry Ogden owns a mobility company. It's called American Access Rental Vans. You can rent a mobility van for $79 a day if you need uh, to transport somebody in a wheelchair or that's disabled or whatever. You can rent this van for a day. He has generously donated a van for us to raffle off um, in November. Uh, and it's a beautiful, I believe it's a Chrysler van. It has a uh, automatic um, remote controlled ramp inside with an electric door for anyone that is disabled and you could be a lucky winner. And I believe the tickets are $25 for one and three for 50. And we are in the process right now of making sure that we get our tickets ready so that you have an opportunity to uh, purchase that and be a lucky winner. Um, just so many really great things are coming that's for a, us. That's an amazing, uh, you know, uh, surprise because um, my sister bought one a few years ago, uh, just about four years ago, and it was a, back then it was really high priced. Yeah. It was a Braun, you know, I think it was also a Dodger right. Chrysler product. They all fitted like that, and it's it's an amazing van, but I mean, it was costly, and it also, I mean, it, they're amazing because they thought of everything on these device, on these vans, so if it's anything like the one that she's got, um, that's amazing. It's, it's beautiful. He says to me, well, all you have to do is pick the color. Well, is that you know, you got white, that black, gray, or burgundy. You got that on you got that it, hand, right? I think we decided on burgundy. That, I think that's a good, that's a classy looking. Yeah, it's kind color. of a brownish burgundy. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's going to be lovely. And if that we can't get that color, I think we're going with silver. That's fine too. I mean, but it just, I mean, it, to me, it's a you know, color secondary. You know, some people are like aghast when I say that, but uh, this van is just it would be a godsend if the way somebody could have that for a. You know, maybe a recently, you know, a recent scenario where they had to just adapt themselves to living with a person with handicaps and the severe disabilities, because um, uh, it just back in the 80s or ni well 90s, I had a family member who broke his neck, and the family was in a quandary about getting a van, and yeah. so they had fundraisers, and they finally got a van outfitted for this individual and my family member, and uh, but it was a, it was a very costly thing to do, and these things, these vans are amazing. They've thought of everything. I think they eliminate all the barriers. These things are pretty much totally trouble free to use for your the pretty yeah. loved one who's got a disability. And it's just yeah, really it's important. really an important thing. And, you know, there's more and more companies coming out that make transportation more affordable. And, uh, you know, for me, that it wasn't available well, for like, me. Well, well so the thing is, people don't realize that these are not just mass produced on the, on the assembly line. They, no. They have to take a van and they run off the assembly line 
and they have to especially they have to uh, drop the floorboards on it. Mm -hmm. They have to redo configure everything. So that's why they're so costly. I mean, and they can might take a twelve fourteen thousand dollar van that just comes. You know, they get a special deal, but they yeah. have to take and they have to just basically redo the whole thing. They do. It's custom pretty right. much, and right. you know, even the uh, hinges on the doors have right. to be safety hinges, so there's no problems with the door falling off. And you know, there's just all kinds of interesting things, but it's the remote part of it, the electronic right. part, because that door opens up automatically for you just with the click of a button. And then the ramp comes out of the vehicle and you have to stay a distance away before you can, right. you know, put yourself in there. But if you're a, an individual and, and you drive, they can also put a mechanical uh, apparatus in there where yeah. you can drive that van. Right. This, if they got, and also the tie downs, if you're just, if you're using it for transporting somebody, they have tie downs on the floors. That if you have to have a how a, a van retrofitted, yes. it takes a couple of days to just to do that. Right. Well, these are and these, this is much better because they they think of everything. It's more flush amount wall into the flooring. Right. It makes it a lot easier than if it was a a retrofit. And they're heavy. That's the other thing too. They're a very heavy vehicle, they're so vehicle. they're not sliding all over the road and the wind and you know the snow and stuff like that. They're very heavy and they're nice to drive. I've driven them before for some clients and they're very very nice. So they're all leather seats. And they have a, a bench seat in the back, so you can have uh, three. Uh, well, actually, it'd be a four four person van plus the disabled individual and the driver. So it's a pretty big piece of equipment, family and there's room to carry luggage and things like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a good for trips and stuff like that. And you'd hope, and when they had this kind of ability to go somewhere, they would take that because this, you know, it opens up more vistas for them. You yeah, know? and there's, somebody's going to be a lucky winner. And yeah. we have some other really great things. We have some grills that have been donated to us, and some um, beautiful pieces of art. And uh, just all kinds of really neat things. So we've got a lot of people that care and want to help and want to help us make money so that we can uh, offer that respite services to our caregivers who deserve that short break vacation. So we're just really grateful that we have these little angels out there, you know, uh, circling around us trying to make life better for all these really needed and nice people. And I really appreciate that. They so have some... Uh, interesting weather that's happened to us the last uh, couple of weeks. It's freezing cold and I'm still not completely well from my illness that I've had for two weeks and um, I'm sure the flu is catching up with a lot of people. I'm not sh really sure about the flu shot. What are your thoughts on the flu shot, John? I was at the doctor's a few weeks ago and they recommended getting it so I mean, I usually don't listen to their advice, but I did this time. And so far, I avoided it. It might have been just luck. You might have, the flu shot might have had something to do with it. Yeah. I don't know. But typically, I don't try to get them because you know, I just think you got to be cautious of what you put in your body. You don't know what that could have done. Mm -hmm. And not that I have the conspiracy mind. I just basically think a lot of times they they mean it for mean it for a good thing. To it's well intended, but it actually has a reverse effect. So so yeah. far, I've avoided the flu, but I've had some small cold, uh, two small colds. Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, go on in the past few weeks. So. It's a bad, this is the weirdest thing because we need a cold winter to kill the germs. And it, we might get a little cold for one or two days, but not a long stretch of cold weather. It's yo yo, and that's actually Isn't causing sinus it? problems. It causes sinus infections. Yes. Because you got that stuff build up in your skull. And, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, yeah, and I think that's what's going on with me now. It's an upper respiratory type of a thing, but I'm not contagious anymore, so that's good. But I haven't had the flu in probably five or six years. and it hit me like a ton of bricks. Well, see, people don't realize this, but um, I just saw this again on the History Channel. During the first time of the First World War was raging in, this, in Europe, there was millions of people dying of what they call the Spanish influenza. And mm -hmm. actually, it was a precursor of the first one, H1N1 virus. And yeah. um, it wiped out... I think worldwide, eight to 14 million people at this time during the, you know, it actually killed more soldiers in the First World War than the war itself did. Yeah, I've forgotten about that. Yeah. yeah, some of these things are repeating themselves, but we just, I don't know what the answer is. You know, we're talking about air pollution and global warming, and, you know, I just don't know what the answer is anymore. I just, I wonder if, if we're just to a point of no return anymore with our environment. That's and. A, Seems like it. You know. I I don't know. You know, uh, there's been some some talk. The scientists, you know, we've we had that bad oil spill in the ocean. Well, it wasn't a spill; it was an eruption, and that killed so many uh, fish life. And we'll never get those species back. And we just they don't even know the consequence of of that catastrophe. But we have poison in our waters and our air and everything we do, and so it just makes sense that people are going to be sick. 
but what do we do about it? And we're not sure what the scientists are coming up with to um, counteract that with medications and things like that. Well, see, they, they do one thing to prevent something, and then that has a counter, you know, a negative impact on something else, and mm -hmm. they got to correct that. And then it basically, it's like when you become an adult, you have to understand life, your series of choices that are just going to be trade-offs, and that's the way it is with when you're dealing with health and when you deal with the environment. You don't prevent this, but you don't offset the other right. thing. So, I mean, it's going to get, it's going to catch up with us somewhere. I think so. I remember uh, in elementary, we had, there was this song, it's called, uh, there was an old woman who swallowed a fly. I don't know why she followed a swallow. <laughs> Perhaps she'll die. You know, and it's, and then each, each thing had to swallow something to survive. And that's our ecosystem. You know, we, there's things around this earth so that we function. But when things are out of whack like they are, how can this world function? We're out of whack. I wonder if our world is really round. Maybe we're oval or something, and we're just uh, tumbling around in outer space somewhere. It just seems like it sometimes, you know? We're just so off base. And I don't know what the answer is. It's scary, too, because you, you try to do this, prevent that, but you're actually doing this in the process. I mean, basically, I mean, we, we're trying to, we don't like the fact that something tiny like a microbe or a virus can kill us. Because we, we always want to maintain the top position on the food chain, but we can be humbled very quickly. You know? Very, very quickly. I am not a good patient. I was very unhappy in my room being sick. Hated it. And uh, I had a, a fundraiser that I was supposed to be in charge of, and I missed it, and my staff had to take over. And, you know, they did a fantastic job, and I want to thank them for that. But I did not handle that very patiently. And I, I learned something about myself that I would not be a very good sick person. And, you know, that's one thing that I've dodged the bullet. I've not really been sick too often. And, you know, I wonder about that. So I had a real wake up call. I need to continue to take care of myself and try to take my vitamins and eat properly and get some of this weight off. And it is coming off. And, uh, you know, just make sure that I read to stimulate my mind and try to do what I can do to maintain my personal wellness because now I am the caregiver to myself. And uh, there's a price to pay if I don't take care of myself. And I'm sure I'm not alone with that. On top of that, I'm a widow. So that adds a complex situation. And, you know, talking about that, there are some very uh, passionate individuals right now that I've spoken with, and they are very interested in the widow population and there's so many great nonprofits that are starting to develop to help the widows and you know in the bible it talks about that uh, the church should take care of the poor the children and the widows and it, it just seems to me that the churches are changing and john and i had a conversation before the show about the different churches and their walls have changed and you know it's so true because they're it seems to me that there's these mega churches out there, and they're more uh, interested in bringing in people than doing what's right and spiritual. And uh, and they're really missing the boat in a lot of ways. And so these individuals are starting to form these small nonprofits just to deal with certain things that the church isn't taking care of anymore. And uh, you know, there there's something to be said about that old time religion. You know, and it does exist. And, uh, you know, we need religion in our life. We truly, really do. We, we need to know what the truth is and not always go by our beliefs and what we think is right. And, um, you know, it's just changing. Life is changing so quickly. But we know in the end that we have no way out. We are going to, to face death and we want to be prepared. So, you know, that's another thing that we talk about is making sure that you are where you need to be uh, in your spirituality, whatever that may be. It's not my place to tell you that, but God will speak to your heart and he will get you ready. And he is there every step of the way. Uh, even if you can't feel him, he is there. And I know that uh, just through my own experience. But we just pray for the, the people that are going through these changes in their own congregations. And I know of about three churches right now that are going through a transition and I just want you to know that you're being prayed for and uh, everybody in that situation it's not an easy thing to do but we know that uh, God is with you so I want to say that 
uh, before we go. And I just want to let the caregivers know that you are prayed for every morning for about two hours. We have a group of people that pray just for the caregivers, just for you, because we know life can be very, very hard and difficult. But there is strength in prayer, and we want you to know that you are prayed for. So you never have to worry about that. So... Um, what else is going on, John? Oh, uh, nothing. I just been talking about that. I saw something in the um, TV when you talk about prayer. Um, and usually, you know, I just I don't, you know, add this, but I saw this the other day. It was kind of interesting. Uh, the statistic they gave that people who are believers who had something to cling to during times of crisis in life, um, you know, they didn't state religion, but people mm-hmm. who believed in prayer was effective. Actually, had a they estimate a thirty percent recovery rate that was better than the unbeliever or somebody not det- attached to some kind of re- tradition. Um, which was, I think, 30% is a significant tipping favor if you're looking for survival. I mean, 30%, and it's like, I thought that was interesting. I mean, and then I've heard that some of these secularists try to dismiss that. It's like, well, they believe in something, so that gives them something to cling to. Well, I would say if you got to, if you believe in the right thing, I mean, mm-hmm. if you don't believe that that bridge is made out of popsicle sticks is going to hold your weight and your car's weight, you're probably pretty smart not to go on that bridge. Yeah. But uh, it's what you believe in, which it gives it value and uh, right. or gives it impact or, right. you know, if, efficacy, they call it. And so I, I, I just throw that in because, I mean, it's like uh, there's an age, of, there's an attack upon religious believers and people who have, have faith or people who believe in a deity. And I just I'm puzzled by that. And kind of it's kind of a, the animosity level. I just don't see why this is coming from. They I mean the the people who are atheists nowadays are drawn it's from a historical perspective, and they want to see how horrific you know religions were on the world of mankind. And there's it's un, it's not it's deni- it's not deniable. I mean you can't deny the fact that people did fight wars of religious intolerance. But when you look at the secularists and their Marxism, and which is very communistic, communists by far butchered more millions of people handily than anybody who was a believer. Yeah. Any group of those believers, because okay? they believe you have something to answer to, where these people who think they can reconstruct society any kind of fashion they choose to, they pull out all the stops. See, they look at people as like eggs in an omelet. You, to make an omelet, you got to crack a few eggs. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it's so, the truth. So I, I have a problem with secularization. I mean, I, I don't really have, I can't tell people to be Christian, because I mean, that's, you're, not, you're told you can't do that. But I just say, well, you're, you're, what, what's your, what's your, uh, what is your value system leading you to? You know, you got to examine that. Yeah. And, and when you jettison everything, what do you have left? Yeah. You know, that's that's what I warn people with. You know? But, you know, that's really true because I I look at the sick individual as being more spiritual than anybody because God is right with them. He's right by their side. And I know this as a fact because, you know, with my husband, um, he lay in that hospital bed. And you could just feel the, the presence of the Lord there. Um, I am a strong believer, but I never felt the power of the Lord quite like that. You know, and there is some truth to that. And one thing I thought was interesting when my husband was alive is his doctor was a Jew, a Christian Jew. And he would always say, you know, Joe, it's just going to take a little prayer and a miracle to get you through this. And that was just so um, comforting to know. Those were really important words for me to hear and gave Joe some hope. And, you know, living like he did with that mechanical heart, your your life is not in your own hands. No, it's like you're, you're there's so many extra, uh, things way beyond your control. In that exactly. Yeah, I mean, th- th- that would weigh on, I mean, that would, then again, some people attack that, you know, illness. So saying, if there's a good God, why is there illness in the world? And I can't negate that. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't want to say, so, you know, something cavalier or callous is like, well, you know, what makes you think well, life has got to be easy? Because, you know, let's face it, any down the road, any of us can fall into a pit mm-hmm. of despair if something like this we're facing. Right. But, I, I never understood, like, if you want to use a base of scripture to, ta- you know, the, the, you know, to say that God won't permit bad suffering, that's not that basis or that ideology for that is not found in scripture of any major religion. I mean, no, it's not in Judaism, it's not in Christianity, it's not in Islam, it's not in Buddhism. Buddhism, of course, they don't, it's more of a de- less deity in centered, you know, religion. Mm-hmm. But uh, the idea of suffering as being a way of negating the argument for a God is like. Um, just doesn't hold water with me because nowhere in the scriptures of any of these religions of the world does it say that God would not allow this to happen. Right. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I, I always, I have this theory that God did create a perfect world, but Eve ate the apple and then things happened. And so, um, hey, Ron's here. Come on in, Ron. And, and so then that's created the problem. And, you know, and God didn't speak 
to Eve to not eat the apple. He spoke to Adam. And so, you know, that, that created some real interesting uh, situations. So, hey, you made it. Come on in, grab your earphones and have a seat. I don't feel alone anymore. Good. We were, we were just talking about all these weird things that have been going on with the, the, our cars and the weather and all of that. And just glad that you're here. We've got about a half an hour left on the show. So we were just talking about religion. Can you hear? All yes. right. Is your mic on? And how's that? Is that coming in? Okay. All right. So we were just talking about uh, religion and illness. And oh, I was okay. just saying that I think the Lord is closer to uh, an individual that's sick. You know, he's always close to us, but mm -hmm. you can really feel the presence of the Lord when well, you're with somebody. I think it's a two-way street, really. Yeah. I think you have to have some sort of faith. Exactly. And uh, you know, I think that brings the Lord closer to you because you have an understanding of what can be done. Yeah, the faith, the faith. Yeah, yeah I had lots of faith, you know. and, and that. So we've been just talking about the van that was donated to mm -hmm. us, and we're trying to let our public know about that and uh, the symposium that's coming up and... Just so, I, for some reason, we got on the conversation of religion today. <laughs> we just never know. You know, I was going to talk about some, some caregiver things, but uh, John and I were just kind of taking over and just talking about multiple things. But I'm glad that you're here, and it's, it's nice to have people in the studio with me. Right. Yeah, it's weird. I said to John, I can't do this show by myself. I've never had a problem talking, but, you know, it's a little different to be in front of the camera and uh, to talk about that. But, um, you know, just uh, we were talking about the weather and how strange this weather is. Yeah, it really lends, lends some credence to uh, global warming. Yeah. With the ups and downs that we've had. This is, you know, I've been around here for 66 years. Yeah, and, uh, I haven't seen it like this. Uh, I I just think it's something. It's it's terrible. It's so weird because I was telling um our friend Dave Schultz over there and about the tornadoes in the winter time, and it was just a day after we were talking about that 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 big tornado what was it Tennessee? It went through Tennessee. Right. Oh, what devastation! Right, and uh, it's it's just crazy. But I don't know. I wonder if we're we're to a point of no return. You know, is there anything we can do? Is it, Do we need to get the word out about uh, trying to maintain Mother Earth and keeping the air clean and keeping our waters clean and recycle and, you know, all of that? I, I just don't know anymore. Well, you know, I think with all the recent events, the floods on the East Coast. Oh, yeah. And all of that, uh, you know, it's bringing the past. So we've got to do something. Uh, we've got to... Uh, you know, our emissions from automobiles. And, and I think we're on the right path with uh, different types of, alter, you know, alternative fuels. Mm -hmm. I think that helps. Uh, but it's going to take some time. Yeah, I know. I just hope it's enough time. I can remember when, when we were young and you'd remember this, there was a commercial, um, probably late 60s, or early 70s, of an American Indian riding a horse along a river, and the river had all types of trash and cans and, in it, and he had a tear <laughs> and you don't even see anything with the American Indians anymore right. at all and I remember that was so what a message that was yeah. and they were trying to tell us way back then so that would have been geez close to what 40 years ago should I say 40 maybe 30 right. uh -huh. easy 30 years ago 40 years ago yeah that's pretty sad. Yeah, 40 years yeah, ago, because my oldest son's 39, so, yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's over 40 years ago. I do remember that. That was the the day, you know, when John Wayne was still alive and all the Westerns were popular and, yeah, all of that kind of thing. Uh, but you just don't have any um, mention of the American Indian anymore. But they were trying to tell us something. So, just not sure. Well, we got to do something. Yeah. Well, you know, families had one car, too. We didn't have two or three cars, or every person in the family had their own vehicle. You know, we had the big station wagon. My parents had the Electra, great big Electra. There were three of us, and my dad and my mom. And and then my dad ended up buying a Skylark the first year the Skylarks oh, came okay. out. And then he bought a Messerschmitt. 
<laughs> you remember those Ariels, three wheel German cars, right, and right. yeah, and and the buses went on strike one year, mm-hmm. and and he picked us up in that thing, <laughs> and uh, you know just all kinds of things. I noticed as we were coming into the studio that. The road collapsed out right out. Did you see right. that? Yeah, I seen yeah. That. what happened to the road, John? See, it wasn't collapsed, but they had to dig it up because of a um, water main break. Oh but my. it's like uh, they have roads around here, though, just down the, around the corner from here where, where the studio is, down the street from here, down the other street, you know, the side street, um, there is a hole, and it looks like it's going to evolve into a sinkhole, basically. Mm-hmm. Just anything underneath that, it's the, you know, the, the asphalt's there, and you can look down and see nothing beneath it. So it's good. that's going to fall in pretty <laughs> soon. Dark hole. Yeah, so it's going <laughs> to just open right up. Yeah, that reminded me of a, I love that little cartoon, Felix the Cat. You know, he had the little black bag, and he took the little hole out of his bag and put it in the ground, and the guy chasing him would always fall in. <laughs> that's what's going to happen here. Do you remember? Exactly. Yeah. It's, just, it's just the weirdest thing. You know, you don't even see cartoons like that anymore. They were stupid. <laughs> they were just stupid cartoons. But that was a cartoon for you. Mm. You know, but I do remember that. Felix the Cat, and I used to like Underdog. <laughs> I liked them and also liked the fractured fairy tales. You ever seen them? Ah, they yes. have like stero- stories, like you know, the fairy tales are supposed to teach you something like morality stories, but they always had a twist to them. Hilarious. Sounds I mean, like Bullwinkle. Yeah, <laughs> they came along with Rocky Bullwinkle. That's what the little fractured. fairy. Yeah, the yeah. fairy would come by and yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that whole thing right there. They actually, the, those those kind of cartoons actually were written for kids as well as for adults, and they had like the adults picked up on one theme. Yeah. The kids picked up on another level, you know. So, it's, <laughs> yeah. like, it was all political satire. Like, you know, uh, you know, Boris and Natasha, the Cold War era. Right. That was, uh, that's all it was about, you know. And it's about, you know, the boof of buffoonery <laughs> of spying on people and stuff like that. It was kind of a slap against Russians. It was a, sp- it was a slap against um, America's paranoia. Underdog is kind of like, we do root for the underdog, but he was like, you know, it was kind of a kind of a cutesy, kind of a, sla- you know, yep. kind of a lampoon, you know, of the underdog mentality. Yeah. So, it was, it was a... I liked Rocky and Bowling. It was one of my favorite yeah, Rocky, uh, cartoons yeah. when I was a kid. Yeah, Rocky J. Squirrel. Yeah, I think that's what his name was, Rocky J. Squirrel. Like yeah, there were some really good cartoons. And, you know, we just forgot about all those. You know, then we had our good old Charlie Brown. And, you know, that was a, a once-a-year <laughs> special. You know, and that was really a treat. And, yeah, just cartoons. They were humorous. And um, life was simple. You know, every Sunday night we'd play in the summer, we'd play kickball or baseball in the field. And then about five to six, the parents would come out on the front porch and yell our names, and all of us would stop playing ball right where we were at because Walt Disney was coming on at six o'clock, and we had just about three minutes to get home, <laughs> go to the bathroom, and sit down and eat popcorn. <laughs> yeah, that's how life was. It was such a treat. And then we'd get up and go to school and talk about the show. <laughs> and the golf, and I think it was always the golf um, uh, gas stations that it sponsored. Uh, yes, the, the hour, golf right? station. Yeah. I forgot about those. Because yeah. we had a golf station. It was right down the street from here when I was a kid. And I remember seeing that sign on the show, you know, when they, the show was starting up, that was who their sponsor was. And then I remember looking down the street and seeing the sign there, you know. It was right down the street from where the studio is at, you know, on the corner there. But yeah. But it's been gone 35, 38 <laughs> years now. But <laughs> I'm really old. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's okay. I don't mind talking about the past. <laughs> it was a good time back then, you know. Oh, Things started awesome, changing. Awesome yeah. Time. Everything was AM radio. Mm-hmm. FM was for the elite to listen to, you know. <laughs> and, you know, W. TAC. It was a great station. There was only like six stations on the dial. There was a country station, a religious station, a kind of a rock. Well, really, it wasn't rock music because everything it was a crossover time at that point. Yeah, country I know, and rock. Um, and there was a station called Wham. Oh right. And it went off at dusk. <laughs> oh, it did. <laughs> wow. And then I used to tune in to trying to think of his name, but he was out of Tennessee, and we could t- turn it, tune in to him and listen to him at yeah. night. Yeah. It's amazing to me. Randy, that was the name, Randy. Randy. Randy, yeah. It's amazing to me that, you know, if you were a radio celebrity or a television celebrity, you were a, truly a chosen one by an elite group. Mm-hmm. Now everybody wants to do media. I mean, we've got this show, and we have people wanting to be on this show all the time. It's just a little show. But, you know, we have some big shooters on this show, some very important people, but they still find a a need 
to get their message out mm -hmm. because they share the same common goal that we do and it's to get the information to our caregivers and we appreciate that very right. much we really appreciate you and your interest and in, and in, uh, what we do and your support and so we thank you in advance for those that will be coming on like our national uh, kidney foundation that's going to be here next week and they're going to share some really important health tips for keeping one of your most important organs healthy, which is your kidney. And I learned that too. Your kidney is actually more important, you know, is the, the better organ to keep healthy uh, than some of the other ones. And, uh, you know, that's to reduce your sodium intake and keep your weight down. And, you know, there's a lot of things that you need to do to protect your kidneys. Your kidneys will um, show uh, some, some stress and it'll affect your heart and some of the other organs. And so we're going to talk about kidney health next week. And we're very happy that they'd like to come on. And this is the foundation of Michigan. Mm. So this is a really great thing. So mm. we're real happy about that. And I think they're going to be also coming to the symposium. Oh, and you. that'll thank be you. really great. And uh, we had some interesting things uh, this week with uh, some of the vendors and some of the interests at the symposium. We have a group called the Citizens Defense Association, and they'd like to come to the symposium and teach our caregivers how to defend themselves and to be aware of their surroundings when they are vulnerable. Somebody's watching you, and uh, they can easily uh, snatch your purse or pick your pocket mm -hmm. or, or you know, other things. And so this company. Uh, wants to come and show us some things and teach us how we can protect ourselves. And, uh, you know, yeah, I think it's going to be really great. But he gave us some some little ideas of what they do. And he, he talked about uh, an exercise. They have a, a nun pushing a baby carriage, and somebody attacks this nun. Of course, it's a staged event. Mm -hmm. And so they actually show... Uh, you know how easy it is if you're not aware of your circumstances around you you know and your your surroundings what could happen but then they show you after they've taught the nun what to look for how she was then able to defend herself and protect the baby and it's going to be really neat and uh, we're excited to have them they come out of auburn hills and we hope to have a workshop eventually uh, to help our caregivers take care of themselves so yeah, I think that's going to be really fascinating. The symposium is growing every day. And we're that's really excited, <laughs> very excited. We have a classic car club coming in and doing some things, and we hopefully have an individual who will, uh, if you become uh, disabled in one way or another, uh, hopefully not, but if that were to happen and you own a classic car, there is a company that will convert that vehicle so that you can drive it. So you can still enjoy the thing that you're so passionate about, which I thought was fantastic. Because as you know, Ron, um, I did something that I was very proud of. I saved five years to buy my Corvette in 1995. I went and I paid cash. I walked into the dealership and I paid cash for my Corvette and I got, I paid for it with the price that I wanted and just laid the money on the table and I drove out with that thing and of course that doesn't happen too often and then after my husband got sick I had to sell it because I wasn't given the right information I thought I had to sell it and I learned I didn't have to and that really broke my heart and so to understand all the possibilities that you can keep some of these things um, you know we want to bring that to our caregivers you know and I think they'll really enjoy it because there is fun I remember uh, taking Joe over to the A&W uh, drive through in Flushing uh, because it, we didn't have to get out of the car. And he could enjoy that uh, ice-cold root beer and, and that great Kogel's hot dog with all the goodies on it, you know. And, oh, my, what a treat, you know. And, uh, yeah, so some of those things are memory lanes for us, but, you know, it was really worth it to just see him enjoy that little simple thing in his life. And yeah. it, he just, just to hold on to that hot dog because his fingers were so crippled. And just to be able to hold on to that and get it to his mouth was a treat for him. Simple little things, even though he had coney sauce all over his clothes and all that and all over the seat, it didn't matter because it gave him pleasure. And uh, so we want to just bring some of those things to you. We have, I think, the Barbershop Quartet's going to be coming and performing for us mm -hmm. there and uh, some other really neat things. We're looking for a penny candy store. So if somebody's out there and you have um, 
a candy business, and you can uh, come in with barrels with taffy or hard candy or something like that. We're really interested in having you participate at the symposium as you'll make a lot of people happy. Just give them a quarter, or they give you a quarter, and you can get a little bag of candy. Uh, and, and that That's just really a great thing. Uh, there's so many things that we want to do at that symposium, but it's a place where um, the caregivers can come for resources and and good stuff that they need to survive yeah. in their life. And we're just really, really happy that we have grown to this point mm -hmm. to offer something like this in just three short years. Yeah. Boy, I don't have how time flies. Yeah, it does. And it was just a year ago that we received our uh, IRS status. And that took about a year to get that. And, you know, I've had different people contact us to see how we got our uh, nonprofit and I always send them to you you know and uh, and we give them a number you know and you're we're really up there right now but you know people don't believe me when I tell them you know count on uh, getting your paperwork done count on getting that paperwork sent in with your fee and expect the government to take about a year before they let you know if you're accepted and I get so many people that tell me I'm wrong well, and I don't understand that because... All you have to do is go to the IRS website yeah. and they'll let them know. And I don't think there's a true understanding about um, the nonprofit. That you can get the nonprofit in Michigan right. and that's quick, right. but it's kind of limited. Well, you get your tax exempt status from the federal government mm -hmm. and that's where the roadblock uh, is. And, but you have to have that in order for your organization uh, those that donate to you to be able to claim it on the income tax. Right. You have to have the approval of the federal government uh, going through that process of obtaining a tax exempt status. Yeah, and that's what's important. That's what really will help you and set you apart. And then you become incorporated after you get that, and that's really a good thing. Well, actually, you become incorporated with the state. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, that's a good thing, but still. Uh, you need the federal government. That's the key element. Yeah, uh, is having the federal government giving you the designation as a tax exempt organization. Yeah, and uh, the fee for filing is going up. Also, I think it, didn't it jump a hundred dollars this year? Uh, I know it's at eight, uh, the last time I submitted an application was eight hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah, because when we submitted ours, it was seven fifty. So that would have no, been no, about it was it was, it was eight hundred. It was eight fifty when yeah. we submitted. I thought it yeah. went up. Yeah, that's still pricey. But, you know, so many people are going to be helped because of our organization, and, and we get calls all the time, and people want to know just what we do. And we do a lot of things, you know, but we take care of the caregiver. That's basically what we do. And uh, a lot of other people are coming on board and collaborating with us, and, and we really try to uh, make that point with other organizations and agencies that, um, you know, this isn't a competition. This is a collaboration, and everybody needs everybody's help. Somebody has an answer for somebody else, and, you know, we like to um, position ourselves so that can happen because something I might know, you won't know, and I had just shared with you about getting that gold stamp on your uh, handicap uh, right. sticker. You know, if you have that gold stamp, you don't have to pay parking in the state of Michigan. And you, but you have to request that. You know, it has to be something the doctor, uh, you know, fills out on that prescription before you can go to the Secretary of State and have mm -hmm. that issued. And I don't know about if you get a sticker to put on your plate or not. That I'm not sure about. But I do know the hanging tag. You can have that oh. that yellow sticker put on, and uh, that's a process too. So all those little things we like to teach our caregivers when they become a caregiver to save you time and money. And uh, when you go to the doctor, it saves him time and money. And the doctors really do want to help you, but they don't have all the answers. I mean, they're really involved in disease, mm -hmm. you know, not in all this other stuff. So, you know, if you do have questions, um, you know, don't be afraid to ask your doctor or their nurse and get some of this, this information uh, to you so it can be of help. But, you know, you think about all the parking fees you have to pay, whether it's $2 or, you know, at a football game or, you know, you go to a fair or something, it's five ten dollars for parking. All that's exempt. Mm. And we shouldn't have to pay, you know. <laughs> There's so much that we have to pay for. Yeah. Medicine goes up every year and, you know, all kinds of things. Um, did stamps go up? I was told stamps yes. went up. A penny? Yeah. Was yes. it two cents? No, a penny. Forty-six cents. 
46 cents. I'm really out of it because I didn't even know that. I really, I was sick for two weeks, as you know. I've been so sick, and uh, I don't watch TV too often. And somebody told me that the stamps went up. Yeah. I couldn't believe that. I can remember um, coming home from school in first grade, and uh, the mail truck was at our mailbox, and they turned around and went home. And that's when President Kennedy was shot. Everybody had, you know, come home from school, and uh, I remember that. And she didn't even go down. The, it was a man at the time, and didn't even go down the rest of the street. And they just turned right around and went back. Mm. You know, and and stamps were five cents. <laughs> Maybe it was three cents at that time. But I remember that they were red. They're kind of brownish red. I do remember that. And here they are, forty-six cents. Yeah, I was in high school, and uh, <laughs> I never will forget that. That was a tragedy. And then 9-11, another tragedy. So many tragedies in our country. And, uh, you know, there's just so many things. I can see, you know, one of my people I admire the most is um, Gabrielle Gifford. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's been in the news lately about gun control. And, you know, I've always said that she's a true miracle. So many people have been praying for our president and some of our, our leaders and you know, I look at her, and I think she is the one we've been praying for. That is our angel. She's been able to go in uh, to uh, the White House and wherever she goes, and she is truly a miracle, mm -hmm. a true miracle. And she is still functional, and she still has her mind to think, and her husband's right there by her side. And he became the nation's uh, figure of a caregiver. Mm -hmm. And I've often said that, and this tragedy happened, and... It, you know, he's an astronaut, and I'm not sure if he went to the moon or not. I, I don't even remember now, but you can't just stop something like that. Right. That takes years uh, to prepare to go. And I think about her, and I see her, and I admire her so much, and she's so courageous, and um, she has a message. And people need to listen to people like her, and she has everybody's ear, and, you know, that's, that's so important. We need that voice, and we need to always remember what that poor woman had gone through. And what a miracle. She's walking. She has her mind. She's recovered. I'm sure she has struggles, but she's alive. Yeah. She is alive, and God is the one that gives us those breaths. And uh, He, God said, no, I'm not taking your life. No matter what the circumstances are, you are a miracle, and you are a miracle that I want the world to see. And um, I love that woman and, and what they have done. And uh, it's just amazing. And so I'm not really sure what Washington's going to do about the gun control. I'm sure it can't be an easy, an easy situation. Uh, we've got some problems. I don't know what the answers are. And it, it's well, just... That's definitely a tough, tough thing. But I just can't see the need for military-type weapons with such large-capacity magazines in a urban setting or uh, not necessarily urban setting, but just for average people to have those types of guns. I, becomes you know, a hobby. It, but when they get those sick. types of things, you know, you got to wonder what they're thinking. They're, they, they almost think that they are going to do bodily harm with that. And... Uh, it, it's not like a collection that's going at a case someplace. In fact, my son, you know, I ended up getting TV finally. I ended up getting cable. And so my son came over and watched TV with me this weekend. And we were watching this um, show where these two characters, they go to these um, storage units, and they go to these auctions. Apparently oh, okay. people leave their stuff or something happens and their stuff gets left behind. And so the owners of these places, they have these auctions. So it was it's really entertaining some of the things that are left behind. But but what was interesting is there was this um, machine gun from before World War One, and and it, it was in one of these units. Apparently somebody had put the stuff there, and the person passed away, and and there were these antiques in there. And these guys are opening these boxes, and they didn't know what these things were. So then they go to find an expert, and some of the history that is found in some of those storage units just blows my mind. So anyway, they take this gun, it looks like a, a small cannon, 
And it's something, um, it was kind of rusty brown. Anyway, they take it to this, this dealer, and he tells them what it is and everything. and explains how powerful it is. So they put this watermelon on the other side of a cemetery on top of this tombstone. And then he shows them how accurate this weapon was. And it just blew this watermelon to pieces. And it was just kind of fascinating. You know, but things like that were already developed and created and manufactured uh, over a hundred years ago. And it just blows my mind to see what the history is sometimes. And then they had this motorcycle. It looked like you're inside a, um, it was one wheel, like a bicycle wheel. And inside this big wheel was a seat and a motor on the side. It looked like a kind of a, a push mower and a bicycle wheel and a seat, a tricycle seat. as a motorcycle. Wow. That was in a storage unit? It, appeared, it was in a storage unit. Just some really bizarre things. And it was really fascinating to see some of that stuff. But, uh, you know, it, it, it's just amazing that, that um, guns and rifles and cannons and all that kind of stuff is still something that fascinates the human being. I'm not sure what it's all about. Well, especially in our culture here. Yeah. You know, you have other countries that don't have... Uh, yeah, they use a coat hanger for self-defense or something, you know? <laughs> but, you know, I, I just I find it really fascinating. I remember my father had a set of brass knuckles that he kept in his top dresser drawer. And obviously that came from his World War II days. I'm sure of it. But, you know, he never... He never demonstrated that to us. It was just something you stumble across, you know. Uh, but he never had weapons in the home or anything like that. And when we were teenagers, I was a young teenager, and, of course, James Dean, the bad boy, you know, and the chains that were hanging out, the, yeah. the pocket chains were really bad at the time. You remember that? Yes. Yeah. It, it was just a, coat, a, a dog collar. It's all, it's all right. it was. <laughs> Chains were really bad. Choker chains. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Silly things like that, and it was really a bad thing. But uh, it's, life's just changed too much, too much and too fast, and um, we, I just don't know what the answers are. But I think Gabrielle Gifford, uh, uh, what her message is, um, should be heard loud and clear. Something has to be done. These little kids' lives that were lost uh, was was too tragic. Um, the one little five-year-old boy that was it's kidnapped and held hostage has now uh, been uh, found and yeah, well, they, rescued, and we're thankful for that. And we don't know what type of psychological damage, if any, that that little boy. But well, one thing, he's young, color. so he has a he chance can to recover. grow out of that. Yeah, know, with the proper uh, guidance and so forth. Yeah. But, you know, the government's right on it. They're, they're not playing games anymore, and I think that's, that's the lesson. We're not playing games anymore. It's too much violence in the world, and if you want to play like that, you expect to be punished, and harshly. Uh, but there's too many people losing their lives, innocent people. And so I'm thankful for that. Thankful for that. So how much time do we have, John? About two minutes? About five. Uh, for about five minutes, yeah. Okay, it sounds good. So... Just want to mention again that um, we're having a uh, caregiver symposium and caregiver retreat at the Birch Run Expo Center in Birch Run, Michigan on May 18th. And we are inviting all of you to attend. It's going to be a spectacular event. We have dynamic speakers and it's just going to be a day of fun. Uh, there's going to be some food and entertainment. And we have bands coming out of the woodwork wanting to perform and sing and do all these neat things. And we've just got a ton of support. And it's just so uh, wonderful to see that a lot of people are, are making an honest effort to honor you, the caregiver, on that particular day. Uh, some uh, future um, things that are coming down the pipes for us is perhaps next year we're going to make this event an international event and uh, we're working on that and that would mean that we might bring in the Canadians and uh, have them participate with us and uh, we need your support if you don't show up but we can't have an event and you can't celebrate and that's what we want we want you to celebrate uh, with us because it is your special day and you can enjoy so many great great things that will help you the caregiver uh, to prepare uh, for that special 
uh, time in your life where you know your life could change in an instant you need to be prepared and know the right information so that you might not have to suffer um, the way so many other people before you have and it's also like a service that we're providing uh, young people uh, because they don't know they it's a service like they don't know they need yet uh, but they're going to need that because our wages are different today uh, our young people don't make the money that perhaps our senior population had made and we've got some other issues with the health care and you know just so many other things we've got the natural disasters there's just so much that that's going on and they seem so sort of doom and gloom but you know we just want to get that information out to you so that your life can be uh, successful as you become a caregiver and I'm sure that's going to happen I think everyone in our world and in our life you will be a caregiver at some point in your life and uh, we just want you to make sure you get there and we're happy about that um, you can tune in to see us again next week we will hopefully be on time at three o'clock we usually on the air we got a late start today it's happened so much the last couple of weeks because of illness and uh, accidents on the road and things like that but we usually start at three o'clock and and uh, try to give you a good show next week we're going to have the kidney foundation on to talk about kidney health and uh, I'm sure it'll be a very very good show so with that said got about a minute left and we want to just let all you caregivers know that you're cared about you're prayed for every day and uh, you're not alone. If you have any questions, you can contact me. You can email nancydkatch at gmail.com or call me directly at 810-845-6713. And if you have an idea, and maybe you have a business that you might want to launch, I encourage you to contact me too so we can get Ron to you and he can help you uh, build your business and your nonprofit and get you the information you need to know. We are going to be introducing a really great financial uh, program and uh, that's going to be launched in a couple of weeks and that'll help you with your caregiver budgeting. And so with that said, I think we've got about 10 seconds left and uh, a little, bit, a little more time than that, but I thought I was. I looked at the clock wrong, but we got like about a minute and a half. Oh, a minute and a half. Yeah. Okay, well, we can, we can talk some more. <laughs> 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 yeah, I know. But, you know, there, there's some really neat things. We've got this computer program we've been working on, Ron, and it's to it's for the caregiver to put right in their computer. It's really simple. Yes. Very simple. And what it does, it just helps you track your expenses and gives you an idea as to where your funds are going where you need to make adjustments, uh, which times of the year you have to set aside more money for different things, stuff like that. Yeah, it's it's a really neat thing. And, you know, that's probably the first place for any caregiver to start is to get this program, put it into your computer. I think it can be transferred onto their phone. And when an expense is made, you just put it in, and the, com the program does all the math for you subtracts, adds, does the whole thing. You just have to fill in the blanks and it's really simple and really easy and it'll help you understand um, you know how costly caregiving can be. As there's so many out-of-pocket expenses that you would not even think about. Um, there's just so much and, and every situation is different. My situation is different than what yours was but it's still expensive and uh, it, it's insurance is not going to pay for a lot of it and uh, you know your co-pays go up and you know, you've got deadlines and your insurances and your taxes and all that sort of stuff. And this will really, really help you keep on track. And uh, you just have to be a little disciplined to sit down on your computer and uh, put these figures in. And we're going to be offering that program to you for a very affordable price. And uh, hopefully that will be up on the website very soon. So I think we're just about out of time. Okay. Uh, we will see you next week. Thank you for joining us. I'm Nancy D. Catch and Ronald Rowland. We're going to say goodbye for, for now, and we will see you next week. But God loves you, and so do we. And you take care, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.